Welcome everyone um, to tonight's Poetic Offensive event. Um, I'm Lisa Clark and I'm the project manager at Scottish Pen. Uh, if you don't know much about our work, we're a charity and a national membership organisation working to defend writers' freedom of expression. Um, we're part of the Pen International family of over 140 independent centres worldwide. And we work together with writers, readers, and activists to support writers at risk of imprisonment and censorship, to promote translation and literature across borders, and to campaign on issues of free expression. Uh, you can find out more about our work and you can join us in membership at scottishpen.org. Um, and also, if you enjoyed tonight's event and you would like to share a small contribution to towards our work, you can also uh, donate via our website, if that's not too cheeky <laughs> to suggest. Um, before I hand over to Mario Relic, tonight's event chair, I'd just like to um, yeah, remind attendees if they could keep their cameras turned off throughout, that would be really helpful. Um, the chat box is open if anyone would like to share their feedback or any questions, and I'll be monitoring that throughout. Um, Finally, tonight's event will be recorded and shared on our YouTube channel. So please keep an eye out for that in the coming days and feel free to share the link with any friends who might be interested in watching. Um, so thanks for your patience for listening to me so far. And I'll now hand over to Mario Relic, who is the chair of Scottish Pen's Writers for Peace Committee. And I hope you enjoy. Well, thank you, Lisa. Uh, I, I'm not terribly sure. I seem to be identified as you, and, and you're identified as Scottish Pen, but that's okay, I suppose. <laughs> but that's true. I'll, I'll see if I can change that. I'll see if I can change that. <laughs> that. I mean, does everybody see my name there? No, anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so anyway, hello and welcome, everyone. Um, I, I, I'm going to be uh, as brisk as possible because all, all our um, five poets, they've all published a great amount of poetry and so on, and have, uh, they've been involved in all kinds of activities. So, so my introductions will be quite short and we'll only give you a very small fraction of what they actually do. So um, we'll, we'll start, oops. Oh, oh, yes. Okay, great. Uh, so we'll start with um, uh, Sheila Templeton. Um, so Sh uh, Sheila uh, writes in both Scots and English and is a highly regarded performer of her own work. She has recently won the Macash Prize Scots Language Pot Competition for the second time um, and various other prizes, including the McClellan and Neil Gunn poetry competitions. And she has also judged poetry competitions herself. Uh, she, she has performed her work in Stanza, Wigtown, I Write, and other festivals. Uh, Gadrin is her fourth uh, poetry collection, her publishers being Red Squirrel Press and Salter Thierry Press. She has simply and eloquently described herself as follows. I'm a poet based in Glasgow, writing on all aspects of life in Scots and English. Sheila. Oh, where is she? I'm here, I'm here. Oh, all right. <laughs> right. I had to unmute myself, Mario. Right, okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, um, so I'll, I'll just start. I, this first poem I'm going to read in English first, and then I have a Scots version as well. So. Most of the poems I'll read tonight will be in Scots, um, but I thought it would be quite interesting to have a couple in, in English and Scots. So I wrote this poem some years back, for quite must be 15, 16 years ago, um, when I was looking at television news and, and I just, th this item, it was the, the height of the war in Bosnia. And there was an item about refugees fleeing and, and my attention was caught by this boy. He, he wasn't even a teenager, I think. And um, so I wrote this poem. Dislocation, somewhere in my mind, at my shoulder, he's still there. That pause he takes on the edge of a rocky path 
forcing itself up the grim slap of a wintry mountain. His jacket's too big, woolen, 20 years out of fashion. A man's jacket, bleached grey like the sky and the low clouds. He's going to be tall, but his body still has that soft outline, that tender plumpness boys have just before they grow. His mother climbs ahead of him, holding tight to a little one. It's sleeting on their bundled lives. He stops, looks back at what's below, whatever is left. Even from this distance of camera lens and the miles between, I can see more clearly than I choose. He hates that he is crying. And the a Scots version of this, this jasket. Some place in my mind's e at my shooter, he's I there. That Diwali tax, wrecked on the edge of a rock roadie, burn it sail up the glowering slap o a heath wintry bane. His jacket sour big for him, worst it, twenty years out of fashion. A ground man's jacket, bleach it grey like the lift the day and the lowering cludes. He's going to be a big chill, but he aye has that soft outline, that bonny sonsiness lunikies have, just afore they grow. His mother clems a he to him, hudden tech to the bairn in her arms. It's blind drift, smurichin athing. He stops a minty. Takes a long look at Athing Ahinam, whatever is left with our broken lives. Even for this distance of camera lens and the long, long miles between us, I can see more clearly than I'd want he hates that he's greeting. Um, <clears throat> This next poem I wrote um, imagining my grandfather who fought in World War I. And um, so I'm thinking of that, that um, Christmas Eve when, when both sides managed or, or just stopped fighting and worried the high command, I may say, as well. So I imagined my, my grandfather, although I don't name him, um, uh, as meeting with a young, a young German soldier in this poem. I called it Nay Answer. It didn't feel recht to walk by, to leave it gleaming in the loam. I kent it was his. The han was another matter, ah, the gither. Gousty starfish fingers beached on glore like all the rest, but that ring, it was his. The eagle raised prude, just a bitty chip off a wing. Scratted my hand, though nicht, when stars exploded in frosty peace, and we dared look up. Kicked a clouty bar, our moon-hard grun, I gied him a woodbine and lifted it. Danke, danke, that's what he said. I understood, shook hands and wished each other a good you. His ring felt wechty, bark at my knuckle, drew bleed. When I jump it back, he laughed out loud, painted out a rock bit. I think he said, his mother gave it to him. He marked it seventeen in the grana between us and smiled at me and ate your stars. 
I knelt aside his peer sipet in and couldn't look as I squeezed it free. It didn't seem rare. Um, <clears throat> again, I'm going to read a poem in English and then, and then a Scots version. Um, this, I wrote this um, again some years back. It was at the time, it was 2009. In fact, there is an epigraph, BBC news report from Rafa, Gaza, 2009, on a night sharing a basement with several families. The BBC reporter was actually there and, and, and reported what he saw. Living room. A man is dancing at 3 a.m. in a dirty basement, not for joy. He's exhausted, eyes red-rimmed from lack of sleep, from weeks of falling masonry. Explosions shattering hope. The sour knowledge that Israeli tanks are so very close. Still, he dances for his little daughter. She needs to sleep. They all need sleep. And so he dances, this father, this citizen of Gaza, smiling at his girl, making funny faces, breathing love into a space full of brokenness and fear, reminding us exactly how war is waged amongst the weary, the innocent, in broken houses, the once living rooms. And then in Scots, living room. A chill is dancing at 3 a.m. doon in the clorty foons. Nay for joy. He's dean funert. Zin reed rimmed near gait through lack of sleep, fe wicks on end or sclightin steens, hail hooses tumult doon, explosions chattering hope, the worseness a kinin that Israeli tanks are wearing so close. Yet I he dances for his bairn, his daughter. She needs to sleep. They are need to sleep. So he dances this father, this citizen of Gaza, murky mood, smiling at his queen, marking daft faces, breathing love into a space full of brokenness and fear, minding us exactly the why that war is vrocht among the bernies the forfochen, the sakeless, and broken hooses, the eens living rooms. <clears throat> and um, this is just a little poem I wrote. Um, it was actually for an anthology um, paying tribute to Hamish Henderson. So I thought that's a, a nice poem to read tonight. Another song for Hamish Henderson. Ah, Hamish, what song would you give us a day? There's no winter duel. Pack your pick. I'd like fine to see you, Stammy Gasker, the hail jing bang of them, we a muckle flighting. The thought of you, Steering on our roadies and tracks, travelling the land in your kirt and shelty, speaking to Arbody, gathering the deep songs of our story, burst yerded the travellers' throats. It eases the heartsayers, the kenning that fit we thought was one lang syne, has blaken to ashes, freedom. Nocht but a sour taste in the moo. We're fechting and argy bargin, nothing but a muckle yet 
for our masters to heave through and hammer us into the grun. We need your bonny songs. We need to true that roses and geans can turn to bloom, that your shalt is aye dinging her way to the long promise o' another herst we'll gathered its hard gowd shine, the crack and glint a stubbled corn. <clears throat> And um, my next poem, a, a, a poem in English, I didn't feel I could write this in Scots um, because it is so much about a different culture. Um, it's, it, it came about because I, I read this little um, news item. It was in Metro News, April 2018, that a total of 345 babies have been found dead in refuse heaps in Karachi since the beginning of 2017. 98% are female. Volunteers from local charities bury them. Leavings. They choose to work in daylight, these men who dig small graves. Witnessing needs light. There's Time to straighten bird boned limbs, smooth tissue fine eyelids to tender final sleep. Offer some sweetness of prayers sung as vain antidote. They know, of course, that nothing, nothing can lighten what happened here in the dark. Let's give them names for in the haste to discard. No one blessed them with a name. Azali, made of honey. Azza, gazelle. Shalma, good-natured. Baja, beautiful. Atira, fragrance like perfume. Junani, heavenly. Zariya, flower. Beautiful, sweet, heavenly, graceful delicate, good-natured, fragrant babies, and find more names, so many, many more. Make certain, though, of one bitter truth. Find girl names, female names. Don't insult them with anything else. They died because they were female-born, so name it. At least give them that. <clears throat> this next poem <clears throat> is actually a translation um, of a poem by Maggie Rabatsky, and her poem, I can't pronounce the Gaelic, Meg, you, you I'm sure would do that, but in Gaelic it's simply news. Um, so I've called it news gizent, which means um, parched for news. Gizent is a Scots word meaning dried out or parched. It can mean thirsty. So my Scots version is um, thirsty for, for news. And it's, it's um, a poem about, again, displacement, somebody from their Hebridean home, no, well, a, a descendant of someone who's had to leave the, the Hebridean home. Um, so it's this person going back and finding what is now there. News gizent. Fit news would I face you of this place anew. I could speak about the coarse water brack, split new along a strand, and speak mere about fit why nothing grows now in the garden, you warsled fi snail utwins. I could nyatter on about the bonny grun for ye grape top, pearly buds and new tatties. Ah, sad it new in long, wiry girths. While the grizzled sea chaves on, athing for yart, athing for yart. I could tell you that I took flecht afore Merkin, feart 
for the chilpy glower a darkened wind is. But I'd rather tell you how yowies bring still our green parks and the chill with a small black type still has your name. That be thank it still comes afore meal and mate in the hoose of your brother's loon. And fin we closed marine for the good words, it was your voice in the room. Um, I'm just, I'm keeping track of time, um, so I think I could probably do um, two, maybe three yeah, more. Uh, yeah, two, two would be. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. This is, um, this is a poem um, about John McLean, the, the great Scottish radical, the Clydeside radical. So he was often called the Fecht and Domini, the, the fighting schoolmaster. The Fecht and Domini. A hint your hearse they gathered that December day. Numbers never seen sign in Glasgow, 20,000 maybe mere, stepping out the long road to Eastwood, tackety boots and dainty sheen in the silence of frosty air. Arbody claimed you for the rain, Souls thirsty for learning, you set them a bleeze, give them new in, new worlds. Celtic communism, votes for women, the finish of colonial power, modern notions to bring back the all wise, <clears throat> your blacking, sparkling, words weaving sick truth, kettling up brave hearts. And make a difference, you fairly did. Read Clyde's side set on its road. Your speech for the dock used to this day a set text for socialism, a hundred year sign. Your face on four copic postage, but your stamp on Scotland forever. And was it worth the cost, John McLean? Peter Heed Gile, that rubber tube sickening doing your thrapple, pee your fusionless lungs, fight hair at forty. Agnes and your quinies are wa, for they couldn't stomach another day a mac and dee, never on your siller, your ain left out at forty four. I jalouse you'd say there was no choice, nothing else for it. This was I the dark set out for you, the dark your starnies sung. And I'll finish with a, a very short poem. Um, it's really a hope for for the the you know the, the tomorrow. Um, it, it, it's imagining that you wake up in the morning and you can make the world whatever you wanted. It's a, a poem of optimism. Mm. This morn, the pink gowd a dawn, sclake at a thought the lift, starnies awa, mean gizzent, a thing split new. The world trembles, ready to take a breath, to do whatever we mark it. Then I be swear, then I be feared to make love your choice the day. There's nothing else for it. Love in another, love in another. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sheila. And the power of your poems um, can, can be seen from the comments in, in the chat box. So I would urge everybody to, to keep using the chat box. So th thank you, Sheila. Um, now, I, I, I'd just like to add that the, um, um, the, the theme for this, the session tonight is the role of language in poetry in how it may enhance free expression and further the cause of peace. Very modest themes, but anyway, the uh, um, the, the next uh, poet will be Iyad Hayatle. Now, uh, he's a Palestinian poet and translator. In Scotland, his poetry has been published in various magazines and pamphlets. His first collection, Beyond All Measure, was published by Survivors Press in 2007. He collaborated with the poet Tessa Ransford in a sequence of poems in Arabic and English entitled Rug of a Thousand Colors, published by Lewis Press in 2012. He has lived in Glasgow for over 20 years. Iyad, please. 
Oh, hello, thank you. Thank you, Mario. Hello, everybody. It's my privilege to be here tonight, and uh, I'm delighted to read some of my poems. I usually, in the readings, I read in English and in Arabic. First poem I'm going to read, it's a bit long. It's one of my favorite, called From Al Yarmouk to Glencoe. Glencoe, I think everybody knows Glencoe. Al Yarmouk is the Palestinian refugee camp where I used to live on the southern side of Damascus. And it's been uh, affected heavily by uh, the war waged by Syrian regime against the against Syrian people, and it's nearly uh, it's nearly destroyed. I wrote this poem because when I first came across Glencoe years ago, I felt that I wanted to stop here and cry. I was amazed by the scenery, by the sound of the wind, especially on the side of where you stop and see the glens underneath you and you see the mountains or what the Scots call the Monroes, the ones called the Three Sisters. So I wrote this poem years later, the first time I saw Glenco, and I went to Glenco a few times after that. And I like to go whenever I have time or mood. We'll read it first in English and read the Arabic version afterwards and see what time will be left for me to read another poems or no. Here uh, there's few uh, names of locations, mountains or cities or refugee camps in Syria and Palestine. And I used uh, phrases of, uh, or verses of uh, songs. The Scottish famous song about the Glencoe massacre and another folk uh, Palestinian song in the end of the poem. From al to Glencoe. When the nostalgia of my father's Galilean house attacks me, I come to sprinkle my revelations here. And when the flames of yearning for my mother flood my heart, I come to put them out here. And when my prison becomes so tight, I come to weep for my lemis here. Here in Glinko, on the river bank, Amongst the wilderness of my waiting, I see the moon pale in shame, for from the tears of bereaved mothers, and the steps of my grief march behind the shadow of a girl wandering on her choked voice, chasing the footprints of a child who escaped the murder's knife, and my heart Here's the echoes of a bagpipe, a bagpipe that dodged the stabs of the monsters of the dark and flew away with her tunes still filling up the space with lyrics. In the mirrors of the loch, I see my face, which was seized by tyrants. I, I know these mountains. I save their motherly wrinkles by heart. 
rocks, flowers, graves, snow, meadows, barns, and caves, the silent howling wind, the morning clouds, and the legendary painful solitude, descending streams, ascending tears. I carried their unseen details like love amongst my reps, brought them from my far away country and fixed them here. This is Qasiyun and that is Carmel Haifa, my torn heart between hills. That is Mount Hermon from my violated homeland, hugging the neck of the sky here and dropping down intoxicated with miracles, dancing with the red, with the red deers of my soul, running liberty. <coughs> Sorry again. <coughs> Running liberty over mounds between Ranachmoor and Glencoe. Lose from my fear free. I spell his curves and the high peaks, the depths of the glens and the overwhelming loneliness, the glory of the eagles and the dignity of the buzzards, the gloomy morning blizzards, the secrets of pine and myrtle trees perfume. Heather blossoming in my body, leaning on my old wound, the immortality of my diaspora, my lost name in the family tree. Her smells defined in the bottom of my chest and the size of my ancient grandmothers. Ascending, ascending, it's as if I smell the blood of those who perished in massacres. <coughs> my captive people there and my victim people here. O oh, Kafar Qasim, call out Shatila. Dear Yaseen, please wipe my tears in Sabra and tell the Zatar what she repeated in my Yarmouk. House of MacDonald, O oh, you mothers, martyrs, prisoners, you are you who are seeking sanctuary from death and death. Every slain child in the land of Syria, I am you. Take refuge in me. I set my heart for you as a tent, the width of, the, of this horizon. Here rise the songs, extending their fountains towards the seventh heaven and shining like dew, like a gorgeous morning star, which our survived laughters deserves. Ascending, ascending, the song ascends into me. Oh, cruel was the snow that sweeps Glinko and covers the grave, oh, Donald. Cruel was the foe that raped the Glinko and murdered the house of MacDonald. Descending, descending, the song ascends into me. Oh, elegantry, handsome guy, stop so I can tell you, you are going abroad, but my country, but your country is better for you. I am afraid 
you will get established there, my love, and fall in love with someone else and forget me. Read the Arabic version. So this poem was first written in Arabic and translated into English. من اليرموك إلى جلينكو إذا ما اعتراني اشتياق لدار أبي في الجليل أتيت لأنثر بوحي هنا وإما يفيض بقلبي لهيب أجيء لأطفئه ها هنا وإن ضاق سجني علي هرعت لأبكي لميسي هنا هنا في جلينكو على ضفة النهر بين برار انتظار أرى قمرا شاحبا خجلا من دموع الثكالة تمشط خطوات وجدي ظلال فتاة تهيم على صوتها المختنق تلاحق آثار أقدام طفل تخطته سكينة القاتلين ويسمع قلبي أصداء مزمارها قربة راوغت طعنة من وحوش الظلام وطارت لم يزل صوتها ملء هذا الفضاء يغني أرى في مرايا البحيرات وجهي الذي صدرت الطواغيت أعرف هذه الجبال وأحفظ عن ظهر غيب تجاعيدها الحاميات الصخور الزهور قبور الثلوج المروج الكهوف الجداول صمت عويل الرياح أنين الغيوم وأسطورة الوحشة الموجعة سيول المياه نزولا سيول الدموع طلوعا حملت تفاصيلها الخافيات هوا في ضلوعي وجئت بها من بلادي وثبتتها ها هنا هنا قاسيون وذلك كرمل حيفا فؤادي الممزق بين الهضاب وها جبل الشيخ في وطن المستباح يعانق جيد السماء ويهبط نشوان بالمعجزات يراقص غزلان روحي تراكض حرية فوق هذا الرواب هنا بين ران خمور عن جلينكو طليقا من الخوف حرا أهج حناءاته وقمته العالية تجاويف وديانه وعزلته الطاغية شموخ النسور وعزة نفس السقور عواصف ثلج الصباح الكئيب وأسرار عطر الصنوبر والآسي حين يفوح وزهر الخلنج المفتح في جسمي المتكي فوق جرح القديم قلود شتاتي واسم المضيع في شجرة العائلة صعودا صعودا كأني أشم دماء الذين قضوا في المجازر أهل السبايا هناك وأهل الضحايا هنا صعودا صعودا تصاعد في داخل الأغنية كم كانت قاسية تلك الثلوج التي تجتاح جلينكو وتغطي القبر يا دونالد كم كان قاسيا ذلك العدو الذي اغتصب جلينكو وقتل بإجرام على ماك دونالد نزولا نزولا تصاعد في داخل الأغنية يا زاري فالطول وقفت أقول لك رايح الغربي وبلادك أحسن لك خايف يا زاري فتروح وتتملك وتعاشير الغير وتنساني أنا وتعاشر الغير وتنساني أنا. Thank you. So that was the first poem. I know it's a bit long. So maybe I have a time only to read another poem. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, yes, he could read one more. Yeah, that'd be. Yeah, yeah. even only in yes. English. Uh, well, I, yeah. I yeah, will I will read, yes. I will read only the English version then. Mm -hmm. This poem again called Return. I wrote it a few years ago at the beginning of the Syrian revolution. I imagined that I'm returning to the to our house in Yarmouk. Uh, to see my mom. Even now, I can't imagine that happening, not even in dreams, because my mom is no more and the house is no more. Return. It is 4 a.m. My heart sneaks towards the alleys of Damascus like a Sufi deer in love with a white dove, like the soul of my father at a wild dawn. He looks for an eight-year-old boy flying his kite for a country he had seen only in dreams. He stumbled into a dangling string from the middle of a sky addicted to sorrow for six decades and the seventh to come. He stops at the fourth house on the hard side and hugs my shadow, which has long remained over the doorsteps. He opens a brown door, ascends two flights of stairs and opens another brown door. A smell of morning coffee, which is spilled on a straw mat in a cry of memory awoke in his lungs. The tattered curtains smile joyously at his return. He whispers, shush, and slips left also to the heart side. He kneels over a bed where the back of Ed's queen has been successively broken by farewell nights and the five tales of exile. He stares at the face of an old woman drowning in a sea of sorrow and for seven children 22 grandchildren, three homelands, and a refugee camp. And he long lingers reciting his tears. Then, lightly, he crawls as a ghost and kisses my mother's feet, inhaling below them the sweet perfume of paradise and dies there. Thank you, Yad. There is Thank time to, much. but there is time to read it in Arabic as well, if you if you'd like. To. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Auda. الرابعة صباحا مثل غزال صوفي مفتون بيمامة فجر بري بيضاء كروح أبي يتسلل صوب حواري الشام فؤادي يبحث عن طفل في الثامنة يطير طيارته الورقية نحو بلاد لم يرها إلا في الأحلام يتعثر بالخيط المتدلي من منتصف سماء أدمنت الحزن لست عقود والسابع آت يتوقف عند البيت الرابع جهة القلب يعانق ظل 
مسفوحة لدهر فوق العتبة يفتح بابا بنيا يسعد درجين ويفتح بابا آخر بنيا أيضا تستيقظ في رئتيه روائح قهوة صبح سكبت فوق حصيرة قش ذات بكاء تبتسم ستائر رثات وتهلل للعائد فرحا يهمس ينسل يسارا جهة الخافق أيضا يتكوم عند سرير قصمت سهرات التوديع المتتالي وحكايات التغريبات الخمسة ظهر مليكته يتأمل وجه حجوز غرقة في بحر الهم لسبعة أبناء واثنين وعشرين حفيد وثلاثة أوطان ومخيم يرتل ما قد تيسر من طوال الدموع ثم بخفة جني يحبو ويقبل قدمي أمي يتنشق ريح الجنة من بين أصابعها ويموت هنا. Thank you and thank, thank you, you everybody much. for listening. Okay, thank you. So uh, we, we'll go on next to uh, Willie Herschel. Uh, <laughs> Like, like Sheila, he writes in Scots as well, um, mainly in Scots, and he's also a musician and playwright. He won the Makash Scots Language Prize in 2011 and was highly commended in the same competition in 2021, but he was beaten by Sheila. Anyway, <laughs> so, uh, he founded the folk music group, uh, the Bowhill Play Players, uh, which is available in a CD entitled The Joe Corey Project, Cage Load of Men. He often writes about the culture of miners in Fife, particularly in two of his collections, The Cowden Beat Man and The Sayre Road, the latter set during the miners strike in 1984. He translated this, The Tempest into Scots in I Can Vouch, that is a delightful spin on Shakespeare's play. He's on the editorial board of the Scots Language Society and li li lives in Loch Loch Gelly, Fife. Okay, Willie, please. Hi there, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yep, that's great. Um, I'm going to begin. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me along uh, tonight. I really appreciate it. And to take part in such a, a good event for such a, a good, good cause and theme. Um, I'd like to begin with a poem from the, uh, the, the Sayre Road book, uh, which looks like this. Mm. It's a great cover by a guy called Les McConnell. Um, yes. And uh, that's uh, on the front. Um, this is a poem called Spare Me Nay Beatitudes. Um, the Sayre Road is the Stations of the Cross, um, put into Scots, and uh, set in the mining, the Fife mining communities of the 20th century um, and during the various struggles that they had. And uh, Jesus is a communist miner uh, uh, in, the, in the poem, it's a long poem. So spare me no beatitudes, bless it for the shelter of spirit. They'll jig with angels in the kinrick of heaven. Bless it, for all the one who have been stunned by death, for their dear ends will give them a broad cuddle. Bless it, for the harmless. They'll stravig the earth, never blate. Bless it, for them with a truth for right. They will get uncle Fu. Bless it, for all them who thol and forgive, their mercy will be well minded. Bless it for the same hurt. They'll get to sit down to their supper with God. And bless it are the peace smackers. God's little bairns will hae jam on their breed. And bless it. Are all them 
no Menschen. Ihr auch recht, so dinny be feared. And I think that just about includes us all. So that's the Beatitudes there. Um, I'd like to read a wee short poem now. Um, when the uh, COP26 climate conference came to Glasgow, Scottish Wildlife Fund put on an exhibition called The Great Scottish Canvas, and they asked uh, artists and writers across Scotland to contribute. Um, it was a virtual exhibition uh, due to COVID. And I'd like to read you a wee poem now called uh, Extinction Rebellion. Um, got a couple of words in it, if you're not a Scots uh, speaker. Uh, the word tomb, T-U-I-M, means empty. Like a tomb bottle is an empty bottle or glass. And uh, there's another word in it, hetern, which means boiling, you know, like a kettle. Um, I fold it a witten in a tomb plastic bottle and I flung it for it in the wheat. Can you find us? Can you rescue the hetern world? The waves brought it back to my feet. So the theme of that one is maybe personal responsibility. Um, another wee book that I've got out there now, also illustrated by Les McConnell, is called Earthbound Companions. And uh, it's a book about beasties. <laughs> and if you look there on the cover, you'll see Rabbi Burns mm -hmm. and a giant mouse. Um, and the poem I'm going to read to you now is really uh, what the mouse thought about Rabbi Burns uh, in their encounter. How the mouse saw him. And uh, I suppose this one's keen about getting things into perspective. Off druk it based, I'm the blade of feared. You hunker doon aside me, man the stibble. My whiskers sense a kind but bruckle hurt that wouldn't wish me hern or unco trouble. Wan rest at beast, you're trembling like a linty. And you're a foo with guilt and worry thrang. Like all your kind, you bicker, O oh, Sivonte. You think my's daft. There's small life, sir, for lang. Sir hosten based, hap it in a thread bare coat. Bide, in the hearing news content at state. Ging loun. Fear me the futrit, the bodrins, the stoat. Guys, soon enough, you'll flee with raptor fate. Och, silly man. Well, future's drear, you tell. Great nay for me. Great only for yourself. And the last poem that I've got for you, and um, I'm presuming uh, that there's a lot of screevers out there tonight, uh, maybe listening in, um, speaking of the Scots Language Society, or magazine Lallans, uh, which I edit, um, uh, we're going to be celebrating our hundredth issue. Uh, the very oh. first issue of Lallans came out in uh, 1973, and uh, so to, you know the, the hundredth issue is going to come out in the spring. So if there's anybody out there with contributions, with poems, any kind of writing at all in Scots that they'd like to send in, it'll be very, very welcome indeed. Um, this next poem is maybe more light-hearted uh, compared to what we've, we've been listening to, the fine poems that we've heard tonight. Um, it's called Nay Information's Ever Tint. Tint means lost in Scots. Um, and it's about uh, the dangers of uh, social media and, um, and, you know, on a personal level, how it affects us all. I put my cell on Visbook. Oh, jings. My sight fair barrels. It's I was thrown with wittens and a rack suit to the world. 
There's photos of my outside work with its bonny plastic cladding. The barbecue at the last back end and our bella scouting wadding. The talk I gied at the Provost Club and the Scandinavian cruise. The burns nicht at the bowling club and a puckle thrums in use. My name, Dirrell's Ben the Universe, the whole world kens who I am. I've even got three followers. There's Bob and Jake and Tam. But I've just been getting some terrible news. They've turned me into an algorithm. They've read up all my data and taken my identity with them. They've pockled all my profile and they've gained a thought detection and they've sold it to some Fremit folk so they could swick some election. They've nabbed all my biscuits and now they're passing them round. Information is their currency and they've coughed my half a crown. I didn't understand it. It's weel I want my powers. I didn't like them kenning where I buy my drawers. I'm not so bothered for myself, though I've been sorely scammed. But what about my trusty fears? Poor Bob and Jake and Tam. So let that be a warning to all of you out there. about the dangers of social media. I'm going to finish up with singing you a wee song. Um, and uh, a few years ago, when I was a teacher in a past life at Beath High School in Cowden Beath, uh, I was asked to write a song for the junior choir. And I knew that the junior choir did lots of concerts promoting the school and uh, they, they went on various tours and things like that. So I really wanted the song to be uh, something that the, the parents would enjoy singing and that had a good message, a good positive message. And uh, so I wrote this song for them and it's called A Lead Called Love. And it ties in with Sheila's last poem that she read. And um, lead in Scots means language. So really what this song is saying is that your language should be one of love. And it doesn't really matter what your language is, um, whether it's Scots, English, whatever. Um, it's what you choose to say in it that really is the important thing. And uh, I'm glad to say it was, you know, it went down well. And of all the songs I've written, this one is probably the furthest travelled. Um, because um, the, the choir have sang it in St Paul's Cathedral, uh, they've sang it in Westminster Abbey, the Great Banqueting Hall at Stirling Castle, and I've sung it too in the Ship Inn in Loch Gelly, and I'm going to try and sing it tonight for you. Um, just a wee word of warning, I've, I've done these things on Zoom a couple of times, and people have said that the sound quality coming out at their end isn't very good. Um, so can I just reassure you that here in Loch Gelly, it sounds absolutely brilliant like Jimi Hendrix is playing. Oh, 
hundred times Marcus screamed it Lang Lang sign Then he let your future dwine Mark your be Mark your be love Hear the future ring to us Hear the future sing to us Spear the future ring to us Thank you. Thank you, Willie. Thank you. <laughs> oh, oh. Right, we'll go on to Meg Bateman. Uh, she's a Scottish poet, academic, and short story writer, originally from Edinburgh. She can't help that. But anyway, uh, she, she, she did a PhD in medieval Scottish Gaelic language uh, um, religious poetry. Later, she taught Gaelic at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, sorry, Gaelic, I should say Gaelic at the University of Edinburgh and at the Gaelic College in Skye, where she lives. Her poems are main, mainly in Gaelic and have been published in three collections, Love Songs, Lightness and Air Wind. Her latest collection, Transparencies, contains poems both in Gaelic and English. Her poems also appear in various anthologies, including Donny O'Rourke's path-breaking Dream State. She has also published a collection of short stories in Gaelic. Meg, please. Hello, and um, thank you, Mario, very much for inviting me. And thank you, everyone, for coming together for this very moving reading. I'll read two poems, and the first one, I wrote sometime in January 1991. I first slept with my boyfriend on the very night that the Gulf War broke out. And I couldn't help being terribly aware that the flesh that let us love each other was also the flesh that let the soldiers kill each other and one, mm. one state gain victory over another one. So I'll, st I'll start with this one. Oichia cogag a gulf. Fan sio mar cún gial mar eiclis, na da gúsc mi an tiús, ma gúl úr am húf, a chainanan a lasag an solas na maachnia, is haring mi a chán rimoch, is tol tolachis, chó buias chó fásfer vis a chíat lá. A nóch spregi na bomichan san dal siachat, Bjol a yol banya vachich, boi le gas crain is barred na talavin. She at a strach a stuch na shi, fjol ar karanish, a sluit a gpuz na nian gyala, a nuas gan drabastach. On the eve of the Gulf War, the room was quiet and white like a church when I woke today, my new love at my side his nostrils flaming in the morning light, and I drew his head to my chest on a flood of happiness, as golden and expansive as the first day. Tonight, in the passing, bombs blast away 
mouths that sucked milk from breast, limbs that grew round on the crops of the earth, ripping the stuff of peace, the flesh of our humanity, dragging even the white birds down in the obscenity. Well, that was quite an early poem. And the next poem I read is a much more recent poem. I don't think I've published it yet. Um, just at the end of the one I just read, I brought in the, the birds, the innocent nature that was the, the birds that were being drowned in oil spills caused by the war. I was reading about Albert Schweitzer the other day. Um, he's, he was a Lutheran pastor in Germany and a wonderful interpreter of Bach. He was a wonderful organist. But when he was 30, he decided he should devote his life to other people. He trained as a doctor and he opened hospitals in Africa. And his kind of uniting philosophy was reverence for life, for human life and the environment. And this poem cre crept up on me. First of all, I was looking at roadkill, our near indifference to it. If you go up from the A9, say, towards the highlands that I frequently do between Edinburgh and going home to Sky. I often see deer on the roads, um, badgers on the road, all sorts of creatures. And we kind of think, oh, well, it's inevitable. And um, this poem comes rather bitterly, uh, looking at roadkill and that itself becomes a metaphor for other victims on our roads, on our road to progress, that we kind of, I think we use the economy and capitalism in particular as the only justification for action that anyone sensible should agree with. I'll read this in English first and then in Gaelic. Roadkill is its title. They're like Pavarotti in silhouette, one hand on the heart, the other extended, their skins grown crisp on the tarmac. Shadows of that night they gleamed succulent, spawn-bearing, mate-ready, dewy, ditch-bound in the headlights. There were just too many to avoid, however neatly we slalomed between them, too many different sizes to tell in the rain and the dark, which were toads and which pebbles and we had to get home sometime. The roebuck bald, my sister said, when she cut its throat. Unlike sheep, she said, that die silently. It had no expectation of the glancing blow that flung it into the fence where it stuck, where maggots hold its trailing flank. She thought it better to slit its throat than ask her neighbour to come with a gun which could take a while, as it was Christmas. It had survived the winter till then. Snow, sleet, hunger and rain. It had no desire to die that day. The knife hurt, and a cry came from its surprisingly dog-like muzzle. Before the images appear, the warning we might find them upsetting. Children in the Yemen, like E.T., more bodies washed up on Europe's shores, the flotsam and jetsam of history. Their lives do not count. Their deaths, loathsome reason whispers, pretty much inevitable on the superhighway to progress. Krach mm. and Rajan. Had them pavarotis to feper, unda with a cria and chela chincha, so crech and it fast brisk i the rat, and fallasen gen aicha a yalrichet, sulfur, suriach, skehach, tash clashach, and solishachav. Gagaga tola shachnug, if comas a year met chetra, is kus viet and jifrich in a misk. Gus feichin sin dorakata sinushka, coachka na makarin, coachka a morrigan, 
Es war auch kein Refrain, gar nicht, ich würde kennen. Und ein Bach Ranas, hast du mich schlüger, nicht die Jahre ist gegangen. Ich kann auch nicht kühre, hast du, auf was ich es dann tast. Aber du lecke, wie schon sklöcke, hellig und jense, warum du sticke, ist nicht kriegen, a tollig, a thiss, wie schon blar. Huli kann bjarst, die auch ein Skaltug, nicht ihr ihr den Abi, hier in die Gunne, wenn ich unge, ist genie in a nolig, a dol. Panik und Kreter björ trun jaurug, trun jach, flin, achkris, fischke, charomien ith basiche gen lahat, la fuver is skene gost, lika nuolen, vo fiel fa ekele kolloch wie ku. Mis noch ne jalven, en rauig gedoche gu kudet drugon, klaun se jemen is kollis i tiore. Tulle chorp, ich lati in der Jorpe, und leihe in Schuhe in der Hechtri. Kann ich luach in den Bäche, es im Bas han Reisen gran jelle Kakerschi, gavor durch Achente, ist Priefrat in Erstisch. And on that depressing note, I will stop. Oh, okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, I mean, if you wanted to read another, one other poem, that'd be okay. Um, if you were felt like it, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think uh, most of my um, most of my poems are love poems, and I think those are the best for the topic tonight. Okay. Okay. But thank you. Okay. Thank. Thank. Thank you, Meg. Thank you. Okay, we'll go on to Wahid Davar. Um, He's an Iranian poet who writes in Persian and, and an award-winning artist as well. He is best known for a work which he wrote in Liverpool when he fled from Iran, Nassim's Testament. It has been described as an epic telling, this, uh, an epic telling the story of a journey through his own eyes and an imagined version of his departed friend and the inherent sacrifice that migration demands. Currently, he's a PhD student in Persian Cultural Studies at the University of St. Andrews. So um, here's an honorary Pfeiffer. Uh, his dissertation takes a penetrating look at language and belonging. Uh, go ahead, uh, Pahit, please. Um, hello, Mario. Hello, everyone. It's a true privilege and pleasure to be with you and uh, to read along uh, with such good poets. Um, so. Tonight, I'm reading three poems to you, all self-translated or semi-self-translated because others have been helping me to refine the translations. The first one is Ode to the F-14, um, which is an interceptor fighter jet. Um, so it starts with an epigraph, which is an extract from a Hafez Ghazal, Hafez, Hafez of Shiraz, was a medieval poet from my hometown, Shiraz in Iran, best known as an advocate of wine drinking and an enemy of hypocrisy. When Hafez speaks, it's no surprise if Venus dances in the skies and leaves across the heavens expanse, Lord Jesus in the whirling dance, half is of Shiraz. Above the fourth roof of heaven, where half is sings to Venus's harp song, as Christ dances, a supersonic fighter sweeps past, leaving a circular white boom. Placing his set square leg on the cloud, Jesus ponders, see that geometric cat with spears beneath its wings. Well, not quite a cat, more like a fire-winged moth. And there was I thinking the sons of thunder were James and John. 
Looking up at the blank dome, Hafez says, the damn thing scattered those adorable cherubs. It was Iblis, wasn't it? Venus, heart strings still trembling after the sound barrier collapses, fingertips a down feather of her skirt. A breeze takes the little parachute away out of sight. Through holes in the clouds down on earth, the outline of an airport is visible. Somewhere near the horizon, flames are swallowing the oil refinery. Above it, above it a black melting speck falling, trailing a cloud of smoke through which the pilot has ejected. Christ laughs. Lo and behold, Iblis is going to crash head first. Hafez puts his lips to Venus's ear. Unto the earth, that is Adam falling cursed. The supersonic fighter sweeps away. The second poem is one of my 11 pastorals in my debut collection. Pastoral one. Imagine date palms could grow on this cold isle. Imagine the fairies now on their way to the office, still roamed in woods with lanterns and long white dresses. Imagine in this belly of darkness, cars were cottages, where you milk could be bought all fresh from shepherds. Imagine your mother could cross the border with a suitcase and a sewing machine and come to your house to stay forever. Imagine the border guards knew what it is to trek across mountains and plains. Imagine a rainy night and your hat stand, snowed under with scarves and wet umbrellas. Imagine the Smith Down Cemetery held your blood relatives. Imagine in dawn's sleep, the clinking of coffee maker and cups from the kitchen. And you were not dreaming. And finally, the third one, which is an extract from Nassim's Testament, the 12 chapter elegiac epic. The Bride Salt. We said, we don't, we don't want to die. They said, then if you don't, Allah's earth is spacious enough. Less than two nights later, we sold our house and bought shoes and caps thick enough to kill the cold and biting winds of Dunkirk and Bruges. It was raining. Warm Aquaregia had already dissolved the civilization we had built on the bank of Kalat River. The people smuggler was picking pears from every herd to place in the shipping container two by two. There were two who were mateless, Nassim and I, so we remained by ourselves and Aquaregia flooded the earth. We gnashed our teeth, imagined ourselves flying over London on a spring cloud, and London would be a village like Calat from there. What day was that? Nassim said to me, fortify your heart for my mother's kingdom is at hand. Awan was Nassim's mother. Nassim was Nassim's mother. Nassim was born on the threshold of Sayyid Allah in Hussein's shrine. His mother was not one body with his father, yet Nassim was one with his mother and was gathered unto her. Bahid, who has seen him in his life and afterlife, says, 
his blood was not blue, neither was his voice like Sayyid Alad in Hussein's bells. The day of Nassim's funeral, a nightingale sang in the city's cemetery, Lorca blew into a bull's horn, and the National Library's card index overflowed with his name. He was the bright salt prism who cast a rainbow on the unseen world. And of his funeral, they say, it came to pass that Ramran took his firstborn to the mountaintop, held a blade to his throat, but God sent a ram, and the ram bleated, Prithee, prithee, O oh God's friend, leave him alone. And on the day of his birth, the shrine's forty lamps were sweetened with lemon and quince, and on the day of his death, sparrows lined up like loom strings on the cross and wailed. And a school of soul appeared at the edge of Syria Island and put their lips to the snow spring. In fleeing we were born, knowing that only brains flee abroad on airplanes, but we were ghosts who fled at midnight on a shipping container. My father sold our house and I was the first border note of my tribe to discover the north of the earth. Fleeing was a birth. The rivers were born without their permission and they crossed the borders, but nobody counts their pebbles before they pass. Northern cranes fly southward, their tags uninspected by border guards. I, who am both Nassim and Vahid, was a mateless stag, frenetic, crossing the wet Patagon, and the warden of the plain made me declare my faith. It was raining. It was raining aqua regia as though Israfil was blowing to a bubuzela. I had to imitate Nassim for he sought the way to Golgotha too. So we didn't stay and were healed of Shiraz. Of life's many vanities, one was poetry. And Nassim was relieved also of vanity. But why did I not say he fell young? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would, would you like to read one, one short poem in, in Persian? In Persian? So uh, <laughs> uh, may I read Pastoral One in Persian? Yes, yes sure. So I read that one. Thank okay. you so much. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, the poem is called Shabani Yek in Persian. It goes as follows. Engar kun barin jazire sard nakhl khurma انگار کن پریانی که به ادارات می روند هنوز با فانوس و رخت سفید بلند در بیشه می گشتند. انگار کن در این دل تاریکی ماشین ها کلبه ها بودند تا می شد از شبانان شیر تازه میش خرید. انگار کن که مادرت با چمدان و چرخ خیاطی از مرز میگذشت تا خانت بیاید و هرگز نرود انگار کن که مرزبانان میفهمیدند آوارگی کوه و بیابان چیست انگار کن که در شب بارانی رختآویز چوبیت از شال و چتر خیز پر میشد انگار کن که مردگان مزار اسم دام خیشان خونیت بودند. انگار کن که صبح سهر در خواب از آش از خانه صدای تنجان و قهر جوش می آمد. انگار کن که خواب نمی دیدی. سپاس. Thank you, Wahid. Oh, okay, well, there's a great range of poets and poetry. Uh, we have time. Uh, we have a bit of time for a discussion, um, so we're, we're, so let's do that. Um, 
how have I described this? <laughs> Consider the power that language in the form of poetry has to subvert norms and promote radical narratives of free expression, offering resistance and furthering the cause of peace. Of course, the poet, the poems themselves already implicitly communicate all this, but uh, would anybody like to start this discussion? Or should... <laughs> Maybe I better start it. <laughs> um, well, uh, maybe I'll start with um, Iyad. Um, Iyad, when you read your poem about Glencoe, uh, it struck me how one of the functions of poetry is to show how we seem to live in an eternal present where bad things happen, but there's also also a lot of hope in, 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 the, in humanity. Um, in fact, in some ways, the, when, you, when you read the poem in, in Arabic, um, in a, this bardic way, it reminded me a bit of uh, the Gallic poet Sorley MacLean, but I, I know Meg might be better at, at uh, um, discussing whether whether I'm right about this or not. <laughs> I, I agree with you, Mario. I, yes. I, thought, I, th I thought that Iad's delivery was, was uh, mesmerizing because, mm. because you gave such weight to every syllable. And uh, well, we all composed poetry with great thoughts. Yes. Well, there's a lot of arguments for for taking it slowly, but then other people like to make it kind of light and th throw it away. So I think mm. the great thing about poetry is that we all have a different voice. But mm. I was I was terribly moved and struck by the, the way you del you deliver it. I mm. if I'm saying your name right. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, my name actually Iyad. Yeah, yeah, I beg your pardon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I beg your pardon. Yeah, yes. I should have remembered. Yeah. Uh, um. Oh, thank you, Mario. Thank you. I'm sorry for the what happened in my reading in English, because uh, I don't know. Been four years. Every oh. time, nearly every time I I read, I go stuck in my. Uh, it was perfectly fine. It was perfectly fine. Perfectly yeah. fine. I didn't. Yes. <laughs> and I feel that my delivery in English not as good as the one I do in Arabic. Well, they were both very moving. Yes. Mm. And I think yes. the, I think the difficulty of English is part of what was moving because it was, it, it was expressing your effort to communicate. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it depends on the translation as well. If I could, I think everybody knows this. You write in Gaelic and translate into English, and uh, Vahid, or uh, as I guess your name, Wahid. That's that's uh, how it is pronounced in Arabic. In Arabic, yes. In Persian, you say Vahid, yes. In, in Faris, you say Vahid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you translate them from Farsi into English, you can't get the, the, the right meaning. And if you want to get the meaning, you can't get the same in music you have in your own language. So this is what happened with me when I read in Arabic or and read the English version. Mm. Actually, in terms of the of Glinko, when I first came to Glinko, mm. I was coming back from uh, Inverness to Glasgow via A82 with my family years ago, nearly 15 years ago. And I saw this uh, scenery uh, for the first time. I stopped and I, as I said, I felt that I know this place. Mm. It's as if I've been here before. Mm. But that that ne ne never happened. And when I felt that I want to stand there and, and, and shout, like let my voice 
reach the, the beyond the sky and and need to cry. I, I didn't know, know the reason. When I came back home uh, and I started searching about uh, Glencoe, so I found out that a massacre has happened there mm. 300 years ago, maybe. Yeah. I thought m maybe that was the reason, maybe. And uh, yeah, I, I like Glenco. I like mm. to go there every now and then. And I like traveled in my poem between uh, Syria and Palestine and Scotland by by the time and by the locations as well. I wish I could deliver uh, what I wanted to say in Arabic or in English and translate or interpret my feeling correctly and uh, good. And, yeah. Yeah, despite I, I want to say something, I'm, I'm not sure if oh. how, how that sounds, how that will sound to you. Because um, I've been through some circumstances and uh, so I'm no longer. Uh, well, I mean, the, the, the English versions were, were, were moving. So, I mean, the Arabic added another dimension, but, uh, but I, I thought the English version, and they were translated by you, I, I assume. Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. I, I do when, uh, I said this before in front of uh, many friends and in uh, readings as well, that I don't translate my poems from Arabic into English. I don't, even I do like, I like to do a writer translation, but I don't want them to look uh, perfect in English. Mm. I want them to look like even, yeah, a little bit in a broken English. <laughs> yeah, I, I want the listeners yeah. to know that these poems are not English. They, these poems come from different language and mm -hmm. from different culture, from different background. Mm -hmm. And I do try my best to, uh, to put the ideas I have in Arabic into English. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted to say, um, uh, <laughs> I'm a yeah. little bit, not a little bit, I'm very much lazy in my, <laughs> yeah, in my writing <laughs> and in my translation. Yeah, yeah because I'm busy with, uh, with life and uh, yep. so don't, don't do that much uh, uh, putting that effort in mm. writing and reading, so okay. I'm sorry for that. So, okay, but but let, let, let's go on to um, let's go on to Scots, uh, to uh, Sheila and Willie. Uh, how important do you think Scots is in Scotland? Um, do you want how how important is Scots in, in Scotland? Yeah, cu how culturally important, yeah. politically possibly as well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think it's um, something that's spoken about right now much more than, say, when I was young. You know, yeah, we, yes. I'm, I'm sure, yeah. Uh, suddenly uh, become a hot topic, which which is wonderful in a lot of ways. And yeah. um, also makes, I mean, I'm finding because people are discussing more and more what Scott says, mm. um, it, it does make me a little tentative, more tentative now, which is a shame because mm. when I first started writing in Scots, I just wrote in my my, my natural northeast Scots, which is called mm. Doric sometimes. Oh, yes. And I was, I was happy doing that because that was the language I spoke really until I left home and had to mm. amend things a bit. I trained as a teacher in London mm. 
Um, yep. Northeast accent didn't go down too well. Um, <laughs> but so when I first started writing, I was just writing in the way that I still spoke. I'm finding now, I'm trying a bit more to do a kind of more generic Scots, and I'm, I'm not sure that's actually a good idea. I was just thinking tonight, looking at some of my poems, which some of which are older, I think mm. I'm just going to go back to writing in pure natural northeast Aberdeenshire mm. and um, hell mend them, <laughs> if, you know, if you see what I mean. I don't know how you feel, Willie. You, you write Yeah, yeah, could I, I maybe see some of the Scots? I mean, that's a personal view, but uh, I think part of the problem is that we uh, allow ourselves to believe that Scots is a minority language in Scotland. It's not. Um, and I think the 2011 census uh, dispelled that myth. But we've had maybe 300 years of social conditioning and mm. a colonialist educational system, which has made us think that it's a kind of perpetually dying language when it's not. It's just it's not the, uh, the, 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 the status language, if you like, you know. Yeah. I was thinking tonight, and I was listening to that poem about a massacre that happened in Glencoe 300 years ago. You know, massacres are happening all over the world in the present. Yeah. But as we have this event here tonight, uh, we are effectively pretty powerless in Scotland because we don't we don't have our own government, we don't have in, any independence, so we don't have a voice in the international stage. Um, mm. You know. Uh, a government in Westminster can put nuclear weapons in our country, we've got no say in it. Uh, a government in Westminster can, you know, go to war in the Ukraine or wherever, stick their Union Jack wherever they want to. But uh, we don't really have any, any power or influence in that. You know, we can make the right kind of noises about we'd all love to, to live in some kind of utopia, but we can't exert any kind of uh, pressure because we don't have a voice. Um, so really until that I mean you, you've got to start with what you can achieve So there's a political dimension as well isn't there? Yes Yes. You yeah. know, and until whatever kind of government you get until you have a kind of mm -hmm. accountable government to the Scottish mm -hmm. people uh, we, we're kind of factored out uh, uh, a lot of the kind of big stuff that's going on in the world mm -hmm. um, and we can't have an influence for the good uh, I mean we saw that with the, the Brexit thing you know where the majority people culturally in Scotland have a kind of different viewpoint but it's not mm -hmm. one that's taken into account so um, I think Scots is really really important because over two million people speak it mm. so as I say it's not a minority language um, it's a it's the language of, you know lowland Scotland um, and and again we've just been told that uh, mm. It's a thing that's dying out. I mean, it never actually has. Mm. I mean, I think in Burns' time, Burns was worried about Scots dying out, which is one of the reasons why he wrote all these brilliant songs. Um, mm. But it was it was nonsense. <laughs> okay, that's controversial, well, folk. I'll, I'll shut up now. <laughs> well, look, th thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, we, we, we could actually go on for hours <laughs> on these topics, but uh, <laughs> and, and we, we haven't even... Uh, um, brought peace to the world yet but anyway so, 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 but 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 th th thank you very much uh, uh, uh yeah, i hope everybody I, I, I hope everybody who tuned in enjoyed this uh session and uh well good luck of everyone oh,